Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for this uh, launch of the second public consultation on the bond sucro uh, standards. And Nicola Via, I'm the director of standard innovation at bond sucro, and it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. We will have some housekeeping rules to start with, uh, so uh, we know how the webinar will work. Uh, the session is recorded. Um, we have now launched a, a record. Uh, we will circulate the slide and the recording afterward. They will be available on the Bon Sucro website. You will see at the bottom of your screen various functions from uh, Zoom. We will ask you to ask your questions uh, at any time during the presentation using the Q&A button. So you will see if you click on it, you will have a pop-up window and you can write your question that will be sent to us. And we will answer it at the end uh, of the, the second part of the presentation. Simultaneous translation is not available on this uh, webinar, but will be available in the session we are doing as well in Spanish and Portuguese. And we will remind you of the date. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, today uh, for this webinar by four uh, additional panelists. Uh, so the first one will be um, Nawel Tunyon, Standard Manager of Bon Sucro, Bilge Daldeniz, Associate Director of Proforest, who has supported us uh, through the second phase of the revision, Miguel Tejada as Vice Chair of the Standard Revision Working Group, and Olivia Scholz as well, uh, Working Group Member. So thank you very much to all the panelists who have joined us today. And I would like to invite Miguel Tejada as the chair of the working group to do the formal opening of this session. Miguel. You're on mute, Miguel. Do you hear me there? Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very happy that you joined us to this public second public consultation. Uh, we have been now working on this standard for two years, more than two years. Uh, and it has been a, a very good work, a very interesting work for us uh, to put all together. Uh, I can say that uh, we haven't been all time aligned or agreed, uh, but I'm sure that this is a very good document and we hope that we have a lot of comments from you and a lot of inputs and feedback. So welcome uh, and I'm waiting for your participation on this. Thank you, Miguel. Welcome. <laughs> So we will have a, a four-point agenda today. So we have our opening remarks. Uh, then we will have an overview of the uh, participation uh, to the first public consultation, as well as following those uh, consultation, uh, how the working group have addressed some of the main topics that were commented upon during the first consultation, uh, and uh, as well as the process followed uh, through the second phase of so the work that Coforest has carried and help us with through the last eight months. And finally, as I was saying, uh, a comment on uh, general cross-cutting comments received and the main changes that we brought or the working group brought to the standard that we're presenting today. As I was mentioning, there is no direct uh, translation for these sessions, but we will have a translation available for two uh, additional sessions we are doing in Portuguese and Spanish. That will be on the 16th of June at 4 p.m. British summer time and in Spanish on the 17th of June at 3 p.m. British summer time. And we have an additional English session tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, British summer time again, um, that uh, we invite uh, attendees, but as well stakeholders to attend. So if you know people who will be interested, please share. Don't hesitate to uh, share those dates with them. So uh, invite them to register the registration link are on the website and we will put them in the chat later on. The consultation is a formal process that starts today and lasts 30 days and will uh, therefore end on the 13th of July. And I will invite Bilger to speak about the process that we followed from last time we spoke all together during the first public consultation. 
Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for inviting us to come on this panel um, to, to moderate the discussion later on. Um, so yes, um, it's been um, a bit of time since the first public consultation, and there's a big reason for that. Look at the amount of comments that came in, over 4,000 individual comments. It was really amazing to see such uh, fantastic stakeholder engagement um, with, of course, a lot of producers commenting, um, many of those from Latin America, uh, many members um, at Bonsupro certified um, organizations being involved, but also from other parts of um, the, the great uh, stakeholder um, ecosystem at Bonsupro. So we had a variety of comments. Um, that reflected really the, the different positions um, that everybody had. Um, next slide, please, Noel. So to give you a bit of a feel, um, the last public consultation happened in 2020, June, July. It took a couple of months to work through all of those comments um, and analyze them um, thoroughly and prepare um, the, the analysis report for the working group. Um, and as you can see, the working group um, has indeed been very busy and this is um, a much um, reduced uh, reflection of um, how many meetings and rounds of comments um, they themselves um, had on this. Um, it's a point to remind maybe everyone as well, um, under normal circumstances, this would likely have happened with physical meetings where the working group could have been together for a few days, entirely focusing on this. And instead, what we had to do is try to replicate that as much as we could remotely, bearing in mind that our working group members are spread out from Australia all the way to the Americas, um, which gives us very short window of a couple of hours where we can feasibly um, all get together on a regular basis. We'll look a little bit more um, at the, the amount of work that went in in a minute, but just to flag, this uh, second public consultation is happening now for 30 days until the middle of July. We will then have um, a process of analyzing all the inputs that we receive via the online survey. Um, and the working group is targeting um, very ambitiously September to be able to present um, the, the final uh, revised standard to uh, the Technical Advisory Board and Members Council. Um, in parallel to this, uh, there's also uh, the revision, of course, of the associated documents going on, so the certification protocol, auditor guidance, um, as well as the calculator. So um, it's it's a lot of work um, that's, that's happening um, to, to make all of this become a reality. On the next slide, um, we have the stats. So what we try to reflect simply on the timeline um, is actually a great number of meetings, several full working group calls. Um, we divided the standard into um, the, the principles and worked there with uh, subgroups specifically who again had additional calls. Um, in between that, there were uh, rounds of review of each of the suggestions made. Uh, we called them homework uh, because it did feel a little bit like that, frankly, for the working group um, who were asked to read through the colleagues' suggestions, make counter proposals, and agree. Um, and at times, we also had uh, several members get together to iron out um, some discussions they were having on specific topics. So this is what we refer to on here as, as mini group work. So all of this was necessary to pull that revised draft together um, to work through all the comments that came in and we counted. And in fact, we had sort of 30 plus versions of the different documents, bearing in mind that this was also split um, into the different principles. So um, yeah, I think um, at this point, the, the standard revision working group really um, deserves a lot of thanks from the wider Bonsucro membership for all the efforts that were put in. And to give you some um, visuals on that, on the next slide, we um, wanted to just show you what that looked like in practical terms. 
So for the first public consultation, there's a ginormous Excel spreadsheet um, where we had all the detailed comments listed, analyzed, both in terms of the content and statistically, um, which then were translated into a big summary report where we pulled out the comments indicator by indicator for the working group to really allow them to, to think through what the differing views were that came in because they, they weren't um, all uh, coming from the same direction, of course, um, and discuss and come up with the consensus. Um, this happened not just via the teleconferences and subgroup calls and, and uh, one-on-ones that they arranged, but also via very um, transparent and clearly organized um, review processes internally where shared Excel spreadsheets were designed where they could um, put suggestions forward for improvements, colleagues from the working group would revise it, and then this would be brought back um, to the wider working group. Below you see a version um, that was kind of the working document um, for the second phase of the work. So within the working document, um, the working group also took a look at draft guidance for uh, implementation, which is uh, in blue on there. It's now placed in an annex in the uh, standard that's presented to public consultation. And there's hot links from each indicator to its corresponding guidance and back to make it as user friendly as it can be. And they also looked at specific guidance for auditors that um, has now been integrated into its own uh, document, the auditor guidance, um, which the auditors will use for pilot uh, audits. And um, there will also be CB workshops where that part will be consulted upon as well. And yeah, also a quick glimpse on, on some of the subgroup calls we had there. Um, working through one of the, the principles in, in particular. So yes, it's it's been a, a busy a little period, um, but you, you will see when you look at the details in the revised version of the standard, um, how much it has progressed from that first standard that you were all looking at last year. And with that, um, I'll hand back to Nicola. Thank you very much, Bilge. Yes, indeed, the uh, huge amount of work and exchange among the working group members that was very, for me, very interesting to follow and to witness. So, as you may know, um, Bonsucro has just launched our latest strategy, um, and you might have attended uh, our webinar last in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the recordings of which are available on our website. Um, you can find the detailed strategic plan as well as the summary of it on the website, uh, all the information are there. And while the standard revision started before the standard uh, review started, there is clear synergies and alignment between the strategy uh, Bonsucro will pursue, which is called Changing for Good, and the content of the Bonsucro production standards the working group has reached consensus on. Next, Next slide. Yeah. Um, the strategic plan 21-26 are built on many achievements to date by the organization, but as well reflect on the lesson learned. We have set our agenda for change to deliver more real value and make a bigger impact for the sugarcane sector. On the next slide, we'll see how Bonsucro position uh, itself for the future. Um, we are the only sugarcane sustainability initiative that combines all the following characteristics exclusive uh, to sugarcane. We are a full member of ICIL, which means we have credibility in our standards, setting processes, assurance process, as well as the claim we're making through the certification. We focus on continuous improvement. We have a global reach with local presence and uh, multi stakeholder memberships uh, that govern uh, and governance and a broad uh, role as a platform for change beyond the membership. And with a dynamic and urgent global context, uh, we are all called in the stakeholder and in the sector to make significant and sufficient progress on the global goal for sustainability and climate change. So thankfully, uh, despite the deep disruption of COVID-19, 
Um, the global drive for more sustainable supply chain continues across all key sectors and definitely in the food, the drink, the fuel and the pack packaging sector uh, where we operate. Finance, uh, financing sustainable growth and the transition to decarbonize and climate resilient economy will be an overarching theme for investors. Meeting at least the minimum safeguard on human rights and social standards will become increasingly important for the private sector. Environmental, social and governance issues are now becoming core financial and legal compliance risk. For example, the new EU Green Deal will have an impact on supply chain way beyond the European borders. From this context, uh, we derive the key input to our strategy. We want to make sure we remain relevant and purposeful within the content, uh, the current and emerging global context, while delivering value to all our members and building an adaptable, resilient, and data driven organization to meet the need of the future. So, for this, we will continue to show how we can contribute to the SDGs. We will demonstrate the business case uh, to financial institutions and other investors. We will push for GAG reduction in line with the Paris Agreement and build climate resilience. We will work with partners to innovate and widen access uh, to appropriate technologies. We will take actions to protect workers from heat and generate opportunities for income diversification for smallholders and independent farmers. And we will do more to enable the flow of sustainable sugarcane to the marketplace and for greater trustability and transparency. This strategic intent, intent has been captured into a visualization, which you see here, that define our purpose and our aims. So the strategy is built around a newly defined purpose, which is to collectively accelerate the sustainable production and use of sugarcane. And there is three strategic aims, which align with the three pillars of sustainable development and define how we will contribute to the SDGs. The three aims are interdependent and non-hierarchical. For each strategic aim, we have set high-level objectives supported by targets and indicators. So implementation will, design, will be designed around five strategic priorities, which are in light blue on the wheel, delivered through six activity streams that are in green and underpinned by four core principles that are in orange. So it's a bit small on the screen, but the full detail and, uh, of the plan is available on the website. And I really invite you to, to go and have a look to see how we will put ourselves and work with you in the next five years. So now that we have the context in which Bonsoco will operate over the next five years, we will present how the working group has addressed the comments received during the first consultation when defining the content of this uh, published second draft. So the first uh, set of comments were around the scope of implementation. So the working group recognized the challenge uh, certified operators might face when trying to reach out uh, to independent farmers beyond the unit of certification, especially if these farmers have not yet engaged on the sustainability journey. The working group rec recognized that every operator have access to different level of resources and face different challenges. Using their experience, the working group identified a mechanism that takes these points into consideration to help producers moving forward. The mechanism is called the time-bound progressive implementation plan. Producers are invited to create their own path and own timeline. Rolling out the requirement beyond the unit of certification might take two years, might take 10 years. Things can go on the way, plans might change. The purpose here, here is not so much on how fast the standard is rolled out, but how operators plan for the future and how committed and self-compliant each operator is with their own plan. If we speak about auditing, the role of auditors is to verify that each operator complies with what they've committed to. The audit will not look at the whole supply area and the expectation is not that there is compliance in the full supply area, but what actions operators take to influence and encourage independent producers to make improvements. For the certified members, this approach is very similar to one uh, we use when the minor non-conformity is raised. Operators are required to develop and implement what uh, they do to become in compliance over time. So each operator put in place a plan to become compliant. 
the approach has been replicated here. The second comment was about the economic implications on the producers. So the working group want operators to keep sight of the end point and the end game and remain proactive in rolling out sustainability to the whole supply chain. Why? Only because it is good for business, good for the people and good for the planet. The sustainability supply chain benefits farmers, local communities, economy, workers, millers and supply chain actors. It is very clear that the working group does not want to add additional economical burden to an already pressured sector, which recovers or just recover from the pandemic and low sugar cane price, sugar price. The time bound plan presented just before, as well as the indicators as described in the draft, clearly invites operators to work at their own pace according to the, their resources and their own priorities. A great example of if we are thinking about other time bound plan was in the past the program Renovação in Brazil that was moving from uh, cane burning to green harvest in the central south. The plan didn't impose green cutting from day one. It set a 10 year plan with intermediary targets. And it turned out that operators achieved their own targets much earlier than expected because new techniques, new knowledge have enabled accelerated transformation. And the working group believe the same will happen or could happen with those plans, starting slow to reach peak. The next comment was about national context. As first sight, for the first time, um, environmental and social governance issues are now moving beyond reputation and sufficient uh, resilience risk to become core financial and legal compliance risk. Meeting at least the minimum safeguard on human rights and social standards will become increasingly important to the private sector. As such, the working group has grounded some indicators in international best practices and code of compliance, ILO, WHO, UNGP, OECD. These practices might sometimes go beyond national legislation. And this is not new to Bonsoko. As an example, is the list of ban agrochemicals. Um, Bonsoko goes beyond national legislation, even ban a series of the most harmful uh, agrochemicals. So for this near, new additions, the working group also acknowledged that change can take time and resources, and therefore have added some transition timing into the requirement to allow time for operators to adapt. The next comment was about the lack of guidance. That's true during the first consultation was about the standard itself without the guidance. A large part of the second phase of the development was spent by the working group on developing a comprehensive guidance document, and you will see in the annex of the standards. The document draws from the expertise and experience from each working group member in the various field of expertise, ranging across the three pillars of sustainability. Built as a how-to guide, the guidance provides rich content to the practitioners of the standards and aims at offering tips and suggestions when working toward compliance. The guidance is for information only in compliance. Again, the guidance is not part of the certification of it. It is a source of knowledge, a support to internal and external training program that we hope will be useful for all the operators that engage into the certification process. Another range of comments that was as well I commented was decent living wage. So a lot has been said and commented upon it during the first consultation and all those comments have been taken very seriously in depth by the uh, working group. So living wage is on the rise, the, the question of living wage, and we can't ignore that large component of the value chain is embracing the concept of living wage and supporting its implementation. We need to make it clear though that the working group does not expect the living wage to be, to be implemented in full immediately. The standard recognize that implementing living wage takes time and effort. As such, the standard set a path for, a path for change that is structured in a stepwise manner. All living wage experts will advocate for this stepwise implementation if we want to do it successfully. The indicators uh, indicate that operators will reduce the gap, meaning the gap between current salaries and living wage, for 5% in the first three years and 10% over the following three years. 
you won't make this journey alone. In his new strategic plan, and that's why I wanted to recall the new strategy, Bonsoko has committed to play a role in gathering the supply chain actors around the topic of living wage, as we recognize that nobody should be left alone to address it. This indicator on top is non-core, meaning that it won't affect the certification decision outright. The other um, cross-cutting uh, uh, indicator that received a lot of comments was working hours. So we all recognize that working in the can sector can be demanding and carried out in an unfriendly, unhealthy, and dangerous condition. International guidance are extensive on the need to manage maximum hours of work to safeguard the health and safety of workers and ensure sustainable long-term productivity. Various countries have tackled the issue heads on and successfully worked to reduce the total hours of work for the most dangerous work. Inspired by the successes and benefits that have emerged from this, the working group have included the limit of 60 hours per week. The working group has also heard the feedback from the stakeholders and agreed that it is necessary to allow a period from three to five years to roll out these indicators. This allow companies to prepare and adapt. The working group also recognized that there may be occasional occurrences that some workers must have to work uh, over 60 hours a week. This is permissible and guidance set out the framework on how to deal with those exceptional circumstances. The next point that received comment as well was HCV, the high, um, high cons conservation values. So the working group has reworked principle four to make it uh, more integrated and more explicit. Uh, 414 has now been the indicator 4.1.4 and now been split into and integrated into 4.1.1 and 4.1.2, where it's seated more naturally. So that should make the reading and the understanding of the requirement clearer. The working group believe that maintaining and uh, protecting vital bio biodiversity and ecosystem is essential for the future of the industry. And the working group also recognizes that currently vital information and resources are expensive to come by. The changes proposed, especially the guidance that is currently being developed by the HCV network, will provide operators with locally adaptable know-how of how to map the biodiversity and ecosystem services that are on or around the farm. It also introduced a risk-based approach to protecting and maintaining HCVs, meaning that conducting HCV assessment will only be necessary when most needed in high-risk carrier, dramatically improving from the blanket approach currently in the standards. So with this overview, and we're happy to take some questions around them, I will hand it back to Vintage. Uh, Thanks, Nicola. Um, so as we were working through um, the many comments we got in the public consultation for principle one and principle two, we also noticed that a lot of them could be addressed if we organized it um, slightly differently with kind of more of a logical flow. For principle one, um, the thinking there was that first off, we would of course retain the policies. They were always 1.1.1. Um, we would then group the, um, the indicators for the criteria on, on assessing risks, followed by the systems that you then need to put in place to implement um, the risks that were identified, and then ultimately um, the systems to do with monitoring and evaluation as well as grievances. So. Um, this was just an internal reorganization. We also added a couple of um, new indicators, um, one on SOPs and, and one on free prior informed consent to help with sort of proactively setting up um, systems um, to implement the sustainability requirements. For principle two then, um, if you move the slide along please Noah, um, it was uh, similar, we felt a reorganization um, according to a logical flow uh, would help. So first off, um, we retained the health and safety indicators, uh, but swapped the order on the last two. Um, as a second criterion, um, everything to do with worker contracts. Um, 
was grouped there. Um, third criteria was all to do with the good working environment. So these had previously been in um, the second and first indicator. So it felt better to group them together in this logical way. And then lastly, um, as 2.4, uh, we now have a group of indicators talking to employer-employee relations, if you like. So that felt um, it helped with um, the logic within the criteria, um, but also helped to address some of the comments we had around repetition. And hasn't this already been mentioned? We were already speaking about health and safety here, while you bring it up now towards the end, etc. So that just as an aside, um, this is all clearly indicated in the in the standard that's out for consultation. So you can track where um, these numbers have gone. So those indicators have not disappeared. They've just been reorganized. Thank you. So with that, um, I know this was a lot of um, information um, being thrown at you very quickly. Um, the slide deck and the recording will be made available later so you can have more time with it. And of course, the main thing will always be to go back to the new draft um, and, and see what, what you think there. Now it's time though for your questions. Um, we have our panelists here uh, with us today. Um, we have Miguel Tejeda, who uh, opened the session as vice chair of the uh, working group, um, who also is here today with a little hat for the producers as um, he's um, very much um, active in that area himself. And we have um, Olivia Schultz here with us from the High Conservation Value Network, um, who's our expert on the working group for all things to do with the high conservation value approach. Um, and uh, Nahuel, who we've all uh, met as well at the beginning, uh, will be supporting us with some of the questions uh, to do with the different uh, labor indicators particularly as well. Okay, so with that, um, I'll start us off maybe with a question for Miguel. Um, so, as producer member Miguel uh, of the working group, you've of course been involved in the discussions on the improvement of the standard now, as you said, for nearly two years. But sort of in this more recent phase, um, which improvements would you personally like to highlight for us um, that you feel will actually really add value for the fellow producer members? Thank you, Vigan. Uh, I, I think we, as a producer, our, our first capital is uh, soils and water. Uh, and we have a big work on, on soils and water with specialists and a group of specialists for soil indicators and for water indicators. Uh, so I want to highlight that. I think uh, we are producing sugarcane, we are producing sustainable sugarcane, uh, but first we need to protect our first capital as growers, and this is the soils and the water. I want also to highlight maybe the uh, standard operating procedures. It's, it's very important to have written procedures uh, to be clear on what we need to do as a grower and do it well and do it safely and do it environmentally, effect safely too. Uh, so I think that one are very good uh, and it will generate good impacts in the future. Great, thanks Miguel for that. Um, I don't know, Olivia, would you like to add to that one? Or if not, uh, we can dive straight into talking about the HCV requirements as well. We can dive straight into the HCV requirements. That's fine with me. Okay, great. Um, so we had a few comments in the first round of public consultation where people pointed out that HCV assessments are commonly quite costly. And we were just wondering, this methodology that is now being proposed um, with HCV risk assessments, how does that factor in the concerns around cost for the producers? Yeah, okay. So firstly, I'll just say uh, what HCVs are. These um, high conservation values, they're critical environmental and social values that we all agree should be protected. And the basic needs of local communities, 
um, endangered species uh, as a few examples. Um, and um, just to put it within context, um, bon sucro cane production is often in highly modified, modified landscapes. So um, many participants will probably, you know, ask the question or make the point that in most cases, HCVs are unlikely to be present within their production landscapes. However, it is important to have safeguards in place uh, in those situations uh, where HCVs do occur in um, bon sucro certified um, landscapes in order to meet the international best practices and supply chain commitments and procurement policies. So <clears throat> we've, um, but having HCV requirements in indicators, people very often assume that that immediately requires HCV assessments. Uh, and that's not the case. Um, we are, we have um, over the last few months been working on, um, on the indicators and um, building up the guidance um, so that these are very much tailored to the specific risk levels that are associated with cane production, so developing a risk-based procedure, um, and, but also that this is tailored to the role of the mill in having a supply-based perspective and the importance of growers to actually themselves be, um, be able to understand biodiversity and HCV indicators in, for them to be able to develop and implement their management plans around biodiversity and HCVs if they happen to be present. So um, this has led to a bit of a reorganization. Um, the development of the biodiversity and ecosystems management plan now in integrates um, the grower looking to and assessing if there are indicators of HCVs. And if there are, um, that means that they implement additional measures to um, address any impacts, but that does not require a HCV and assessment uh, for them to conduct a HCV assessment to do that where there's ongoing cultivation. Arguably the biggest risk, potential risk to HCVs is where there is um, planned um, expansion of cane into natural ecosystems. And that's under 4.1.4, I think. Um, and this is where there is a specific and tailored uh, HCV risk assessment that growers will complete before they plan to expand their cane production. And this will ask questions about whether they plan to expand into natural ecosystems, um, the size of the planned expansion, whether there is proximity to things like protected areas or other globally recognized um, priority conservation landscapes, whether there are local communities that depend upon those land lands. And so if there are indicators of high risk from that planned expansion, that's when there would be need for a HCV assessment. However, in reality, uh, that's going to be quite rare. And in most cases where there's planned expansion, those indicators of HCV risk, risk won't be triggered so they can conduct their expansion uh, as long as they um, meet other requirements around environmental and social impact assessments and so forth. So. Great, thanks for that, Olivia. Maybe just straight to follow on to that. So you mentioned there'll be a, um, a series of questions asked. So this, that sounds like there will be a template or an app or, or something like that. Um, yeah, so both for the um, 4.1.2, which is the grower um, developing their biodiversity ecosystem management plan, um, there's quite detailed guidance on how growers can identify natural ecosystems and very, very specific questions around HCV indicators. And they can go through that process of following the guidance in order to develop their biodiversity ecosystems management plan, which is an adaptive management plan. For expansion, um, there will be a specific HCV risk um, assessment template. So they, they refer to that in order to assess um, risks uh, of expansion on, on HCVs. So that's going to be a very specific bon sucro tailored um, questionnaire. No, sounds good. Sounds like um, the working group thought about making it as easy as could be for the producers, which is probably a very welcome um, effort um, 
to, to see that happen, particularly in light of the earlier concerns. It's great. Fantastic. Um, so we have some questions trickling in and there's already a couple to do with um, the living wage. So let's um, change over to that topic and maybe now, well, um, you can take this one. Just maybe um, talk us through the discussions that the working group had since the first public consultation, uh, particularly on the living wage indicator. Sure, well, well we'd like to start slightly before, so in, in the pre-consultation survey that, that uh, on Sucre did ahead of the revision of the production standard, we asked our members, you know, what are the significant gaps that are present uh, in the current standard and would like to see reviewed. One of the, if not the top response that came from the social side of the standard was the need to, to introduce uh, living wages. Uh, living wages is a topic that's been gathered, gathering momentum, not just in the standards, uh, field, but in uh, in the broader sustainability field as well, for seeing as important uh, benefits. Um, you know, some some studies show that it, it, it's instrumental in uh, reducing instances of, of child labour or forced labour. It also um, adds to the overall economic sustainability of the produce of the of the communities in which these um, production rests upon. So, armed with that, it was always an um, a, an important question. For the working group to, to take into consideration when, when um, revising the standards. During the first public consultation, a lot of comments were received on, on direct, uh, on decent living wage, the impact. Um, the working group feel that a lot of those um, questions um, were valid, um, but that uh, the concept was not significantly really well explained or well thrashed out uh, during the first uh, draft, um, the working group feels that a lot of the, the concerns or comments can be addressed now in the second version with some, uh, where it's been clarified, guidance added. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to talk uh, you through what are so, some of the requirements to, to make them clear. So I think, first of all, you know, it, it is in the current standard, it still remains. Um, to pay uh, minimum wages as defined by law, that is always a, a of um, founding a cornerstone of not only law systems, but also sort of any uh, voluntary sustainability standard, and it's the Bonsucre standard that, um, that always applies to, to permanent workers, to outsourced workers, to workers on, on uh, peace rate, for example, it's, it's essential um, that all workers are getting paid at least a minimum wage. That is still a core requirement. What is the new requirement now? It's a non-core indicator. It's uh, the introduction of a decent uh, living wage. Now, when we mentioned it's a, it's a non-core requirement, but there's also different steps that uh, producers need to do in order to comply with it. The first and the most important um, is to benchmark current prevailing wages against um, a living wage ref reference. Um, the working group has adopted you know, the definition of uh, the anchor methodology like most of our peer standards done is that has recognized that. Um, so um, there are current benchmarks available that estimate the, um, decent living wages in a number of different countries in a, a lot of different uh, regions. Looking at the studies that are available on web on super certifications, those are, um, you know, reference values are available for all but three countries currently. So in the, in the first place, what happens if uh, there isn't a reference value in the country that I'm operating? At the moment, the requirement is just, is just to, to pay the, the, the minimum uh, legal wage up until a reference value is created and more are coming online every, every day. But once there is a reference value available in the country, the first step is just to benchmark what is uh, covering uh, prevailing wages versus the decent living wage. And in the first three years, so you have three years to close the gap by 5% of that. So the, the gaps between uh, prevailing wages and what is the reference value. For the following 10 years, uh, three years, sorry, that gap in increases to uh, 10%, to close 10% of the original gap identified. And every three successive years is to close that. So it's very uh, progressive. Um, and allows a, at a space, uh, at a time and a space to allow for 
for operators to um, adapt to these requirements. Now, I think it's also worth noting that, uh, you know, it's not, on Sucre is also as part of the strategy and as well as other, uh, other private companies and other institutions are all working on these, uh, on these issues that, you know, it's expected that will be collaborative in nature and that uh, more work on living wages will be done uh, to help producers adapt to, to, to these changes. Great, thank you, Noel, for that summary. Maybe I'll follow up directly then just with um, a quick question on the, the details of that. So you referenced the anchor methodology, and I believe um, that does have room for recognizing um, a variety of other um, benefits that are given to workers in addition to a financial salary. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so if you go to the definition of decent living wage, it, it takes into consideration a number of different uh, fact, uh, different factors. Uh, for example, housing, or it could be, um, you know, healthcare. It could be all of education that, for example, a lot of uh, workers are receiving as part of, of their benefits. That doesn't mean that this, you know, you know that the the methodology recognizes them. And if you are currently providing some of these things as in-kind benefits, they get taken into consideration during these uh, benchmarking exercises. That's good, great. So that sounds like the working group has indeed developed a lot more guidance, a lot more detail, which is exactly what um, the, um, the stakeholders had requested in the first round of public consultations. So that's really encouraging to see. Um, for that question as well. Um, as you were describing how that would be phased in, um, you also described different steps and that actually leads me to a question on the progressive implementation. And I wonder whether maybe Miguel, you want to attempt that one. Um, so we noticed that um, in the first round of public consultation, there were also um, a lot of questions around what this progressive implementation could look like, uh, both with regards to the new principle five elements, but also with the aspect of um, applying the standard or some of the aspects of the standard to the whole cane supply area. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the working group was tasked to explain that a bit, bit more in detail and uh, develop very clear guidelines on that. So maybe I could invite you to talk us through what the main um, proposition is with regards to that. Yes, uh, uh, the, the, the intention of this, of this principle five is to understand and to be clear that uh, sustainability is not a static compliance, it's, it's dynamic. Uh, and, and we want to adapt on this about the super standard and to have some indicators that need to be also dynamic in this implementation. So the idea is that, that the first, uh, in the first audit, in the initial audit, uh, do not need to be uh, any indicator of the, of the principle five, only the core, of course. And after we need to adapt on 20% by uh, each uh, surveillance audit. Uh, this uh, option uh, 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 allows to the company to, to, to identify which indicator they can comply better they can compare easier and they can go forward to the other ones and make a strategy for the compliance in the long term. I want, I want to highlight, for example, uh, let's say um, the 5.1.3 for, uh, for the update every two years of the environmental and social impact assessment. Sometimes we need to adapt this. Sometimes we need time to make this uh, implementation, to make this consultation with the local communities and the stakeholders, and it can make more time to, to adapt on this. Maybe the, the occupational health and safety that is promoted to the whole supply area is the 5.4.1. So we know that, that this intention to go uh, ahead of the unit of certification can be complex, and we have some time to adapt uh, to plan strategically this. Uh, this is also interesting for growers, I mean, for independent growers, as I represent, uh, to uh, receive that aware, uh, to uh, include the safety of workers uh, and, to, and to go through the sustainability also. 
so so I'm, I'm proud of this. I think we, we accept that sustainability is not static, uh, it's dynamic, and I hope you will understand that uh, uh, also. Great, thanks for that explanation, uh, Miguel. And um, maybe to alert um, you all, if you want to look um, at the specifics more in detail, it's very early on in the revised draft standard, there's a whole section on how the progressive implementation works. Um, you have it with the graphic as well. So what do producers have to do um, the year that they get certified? And then it goes up step by step with um, increasing percentages for um, the principle of five compliance and then for um, the indicators where the standard specifies that they apply to the whole supply area, the requirement is really, as Miguel described, around um, developing a time-bound progressive implementation plan that um, follows the sort of parameters and context of each um, um, operation and can specify different activities um, depending on what is most appropriate. So the expectation um, is not um, that the whole supply area would end up being certified, not at all, but that the key, the high risk um, aspects slowly get, um, get get spread via capacity building activities, information activities, and so forth. So um, I think, yeah, the working group would definitely um, appreciate uh, you all taking a, a close look at, at what is being proposed there concretely now, um, which hopefully should, should help um, answer those many questions that came in from the first round of public consultation. Great. Um, so on... Some of the other questions then, maybe uh, now I'll come back to you. There's also some questions um, coming in about the working hours one, which was of course also one where we received a lot of comments in the first round um, of public consultation. So if you don't mind, would you be able to share with us the discussions around the maximum working hours um, in the working group? Um, and the conclusion that um, is now being proposed. Sure, so as many as you know, in the current uh, production standard, um, the requirement was that, you know, working hours have to meet what is set out in the law. If the law does not set out uh, a maximum of local, uh, maximum working hours, then 60 hours would apply. During this revision, um, the working group identified working hours as again as, as one that needed to be looked out, increasing uh, literature, suggesting um, you know increased risks associated with excessive uh, working hours, especially in certain uh, conditions, um, heat, repetitive motion, um, long long shifts, etc. Is particularly lead to to high uh, incidents of, of accidents. Uh, and a diminishing quality of life. So, and it's also the, the, the working group also looked again at, uh, you know, the requirement, not the requirements, but the guidance of the International Labour Organization, what other international best practices set regarding um, maximum working hours. So they took all of those into consideration uh, when they were, uh, you know, designing the, the revision, the, the changes. During during the comments again, and it was felt that it was um, a, a difficult for producers to um, implement this, though, put them at disadvantages compared to other operators, um, that there's a significant cost associated to that. Um, the working group, you know, again, looked at this and they did, you know, take, uh, take these into consideration and did further deliberating, further uh, studies into its feasibility. Uh, the, you know, the indicator largely uh, remains unchanged in this requirement that still requires 60 hours, still has a phase-in period of uh, five, um, five years to put in, allowing, you know, producers to, to slowly time to adapt, to test different approaches. Um, 
and uh, and also I think one one of the the, the, um, the biggest improvements has been giving greater flexibility inside inside what that eighty hours uh, means because there was a significant portion of you know the comments that we're making you know what happens in this particular scenario you know it's not feasible for this the working group does recognize that you know certain allowances do, do have to be made occasional occurrences um and so they they've introduced that into in, into the standard so just to reiterate the standard now says 60 hours it has a five-year phasing so over the five years is expected that operators slowly decrease the maximum number of working hours so by year five, they are um, working as a maximum of 60 hours. Okay, thank you for, for those clarifications very well. Um, we had a um, slightly late question coming in um, in the context of also the living wage and that kind of draws the attention to the different um, developments in various countries and at the European Union level with regards to human rights due diligence legislation. Uh, and maybe I'll just open this question up to the entire panel um, and, and see um, how you would describe that. So um, with all of this legislation being developed um, in various um, countries, how could the Bonsucre production standard play a role in that context, do you think? Do you want me to, to, to answer that? Go for it. So, so first, looking at the, all of the, the trends in international uh, due diligence was certainly one of the biggest inputs that uh, the working group had when uh, looking at the standards. One of the, the uh, advantages of or one of the main reasons for voluntary sustainability standards is to help operators complying with international um, agreements, best practices uh, and norms and to have assurances of that. Um, we see that increasingly uh, due diligence legislation is going beyond you know, just reporting but actions and reporting on those actions that are being uh, done. The Bonsucre Production Standard I think frames those requirements in nice uh, steps that can be achieved and um, would be achieved, and it provides an avenue um, for the producers also to demonstrate that they are meeting these uh, due diligence requirements um, and that they are verified by a third party and they provide assurances um, from that from that sense. Great, thanks, Nahuel. Um, Olivia or Miguel, any additions? Maybe you're shaking your head. I can't see Miguel on my view. Go ahead, Miguel. Thank you, Miguel. No, I, I just think that it's very important that uh, and it's a very good value that was to adapt to this new legislation. I think uh, this is a point that uh, the industry and the growers will receive in the next years. And if we are preparing industry for that, I think it's a big value uh, for the future. Uh, and they will not hear about that uh, uh, at the end, but now two or maybe one year before. That's so why I, I hope that helps the companies to adapt to this. It's encouraging to hear from one of the producer members of the working group. So thank you for that, Miguel. Good. Um, we haven't had any other questions come in, so maybe um, I'll ask the attendees to um, think if there's anything else they want to ask. And in the meantime, maybe we take a minute just to look at the survey that uh, is prepared, and that will really be the tool to gather all your inputs after this. Um, and I think, Claire, you wanted to talk us through that. I don't know if you have it open already maybe even. Yes, I can share my screen maybe so that you can have a look at what I'm talking about. Um, okay. um, can you all see the screen? Yes, that's wonderful. Yes, that's great. Okay, so uh, this is the survey to provide your feedback on, on, on this public consultation. And you can find the link on the uh, consultation page from the Bonsu Crow website. Uh, I've put it in the chat, but we can share it again. Um, so once you open the survey, and we have three links, one in English, one in Spanish, and one in Portuguese, 
um, it will bring you on the on the presentation page or an introduction page um, uh, with all the information you need to complete the survey. Um, so I just want to highlight here that when you when you start the survey, uh, make sure that your cookies are enabled uh, on your browser, um, and this will allow you to save your work. Uh, as you go along and so that if you don't complete it all in one go then you can come back to it and not lose everything that you've done. Uh, another thing worth noting is that you can only skip forward in the survey and I will talk in a, in a second just a bit more about this skipping forward option um, but once you've skipped forward you can't go back to a previous question. Um, so yes, so then the survey is made of eight parts. Uh, the first one uh, is just um, general questions about you, um, so that we know who is commenting and what is their affiliation. And then also, then we go on into each principle. So we have one up to five. Um, and for each principle, we show uh, each criterion and within that, each indicator. And then we have a question about the progressive implementation. Um, and then just a last page with general questions. Um, we've also highlighted certain indicators in red and those ones are those that have been uh, heavily revised or that have been added or are new to the standards since the last public consultation. Um, so yes, so then to go to the next page, you just press next and then any questions with a little asterisk on the side are uh, compulsory. So if I want to go forward, I have to put something here. Um, and then you have either options or a box for you to write your um, your responses. So I'll just put random answers here. Um, uh, here's just a general note on on the modif modifications, um, which have also been covered in in this webinar. Um, and then essentially at the end of each criterion, you have the option to skip to a specific principle if you are wanting to focus on one aspect of the standard more than the other. So you can skip directly to one, but again, just remember that if you do skip, then it's, it's complicated to go back. So let's say I want to uh, comment on principle two directly, then you click here and then you'll press next and hopefully it will bring you straight to the first criterion within principle two. And then just as to how uh, how this part works, uh, for each criterion, we have the indicator name, the text of the indicator, and then three questions per indicator. So are these requirements clear? Uh, yes, no. Um, if no, uh, we would like to ask you to please elaborate what needs to be clarified. Uh, do you have any suggestions for improvement? Uh, the more detailed, the better it is for us to be able to take on your comments and um, bring them back to the working group. And then also there's just a, a, a question here. If you have any suggestions, uh, improvement on the guidance, then uh, feel free to put them in, in this space. So yes, and then it's uh, the same for just the same uh, throughout the all the principles. And then um, again, at the end of each page, you'll have the option to skip forward if you want to. If you want to answer everything, you can just press uh, next. And that should bring you to the next criterion. Uh, again, those in red are the ones that uh, have been revised or changed uh, since the last consultation. And then I'll just quickly go um, to the general questions. Um, so yeah, again, just a, a few questions uh, for you to look at and answer. And then when you are done with uh, completing everything, then just press submit survey and make sure that you do, otherwise uh, we won't, uh, it won't come into our system. I think that's it. I don't know if there's anything else I should highlight at this point, but if you have any questions, uh, there's Nawal's email address on there and, and we can also support him techni technicalities of, of this uh, particular platform. Great, thank you so much for that quick tour of the survey, Claire, and um, yeah, we really hope that you will all make use of it to send us uh, your comments. 
Um, we just had a very practical question come in, which I'm going to throw at the colleagues from the Bonsukuro Secretariat. Someone wanted to know the implementation period of the new standard. I don't know, Nicola or Narwell, who wants to take that one? Yeah, I can take it. Um, thank you for the question. So the rule for implementation of the new standard, we are working on them for the moment and they will be published at the same time as we publish the uh, final standards once approved. We hope, as David, you mentioned, to reach approbation by the end of September, leave some time for design, editing, uh, coloring, and photo uh, of the final document publication, hopefully around the end of uh, the end of October. And from then, there is always a time of implementation. Uh, we understand that uh, auditors need to be trained, operators need to be trained, operators need to understand and to implement the new standards. So then there is a period where there is this gap between, but this bridging between the current standards and the new standard. And at some point, after a certain number of months, there will be uh, the enforcement of the new standard that will take uh, a rollout normally based on the normal si uh, audit cycle of the members, so your certified members. So we'll define that, that will be published in October, um, but we always, as we did in 2014, allow a transition period to make sure every operators take time to adapt and all our partners uh, trained uh, and uh, be able to use the standard. Great, thanks for that, Nicola. Hope that clarified that that one. Um, before we close, then I'd like to just invite um, the panelists for their final remarks, and uh, maybe we'll start off with Nahuel on that one. Sure, thank you. Well, I just want to say, uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. Please do take time to to read the standard and, uh, and the guidance. I do believe that the working group did. Uh, an, an amazing job in summarizing the most important points for, for sustainability, not only that are happening today, but also future proofing the standard, knowing that uh, sustainability standards um, get updated every seven years, roughly. So uh, the hope is that the standard will remain relevant and will remain useful for, for producers for a significant period uh, ahead. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank the working group uh, once again, and to please take time to, to read and understand the, the, the stand and the guidance and what's provided, and to provide uh, c comments in order to, to make the final revisions going forward. Thanks, Nama. Uh, Olivia, any final thoughts from your side? Yeah, no, just to say, you know, throughout the, the, the last six or so months, um, you know, we've called upon a whole range of experts um, to support the working group and to refine the indicators and the guidance so um, it's been a huge effort and a, a huge amount of technical input has been put into that so yeah it's been um, I think the next this latest version is um, something that's really robust. Okay, thanks Olivia and last but not least the vice chair of the working group Miguel. Uh, thanks, Virgil. I think the standard will be only as good as many people can include comments. Uh, so I invite you to include comments. I think we have been, we, we think we have, have been doing a very good work, but we wait for you to do a better work. So please include your comments on this uh, to, to have a good feedback. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that as well. Um, from my side, also thank you for all of you who attended today. I think we just have one quick final slide just to show you the next steps. I don't know if you can pull that up. We already took a look at the survey, which is the main tool for you to input your comments, just so you have the timeline fresh on your mind. Um, we have the consultation open from today until including the 13th of July. Um, we are on version 5.7 now. You can access it in English, Spanish, and Portuguese via the Bonsucro website. Um, and you have the link on the slide deck there as well. Um, any questions, um, Nahuel is very happy to answer them. So you have his email there. And we will also, of course, be publishing um, the webinars um, or on the website. So if you have any colleagues who couldn't make any of the, of the scheduled times, um, you can direct them to the webinars as well. 
with that, I'll head back to Nicola to close. Thank you very much, Vilga, and thank you, Olivia, Miguel, and Noel for your comments and Sophia and Bea for your support. I hope this um, opening was in, uh, insightful, instructful, uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, and I can only uh, thanks a lot, a lot to the working group members for the time committed over the last eight months to uh, come up with uh, a consensus around the content of the standard that is published today, the draft standard. And a big thanks to Prof. Harris for having led us uh, through this process that, uh, as you saw, was quite demanding and uh, very of high professional level. So we are very pleased with where we are now, but we will be only pleased once, as Miguel said, we've received the comment from the stakeholders and I really invite you to visit our website and to register your comment to the survey. Um, with that, I would like to thank you very much for attending and for your question. And uh, we look to hearing from you soon. Have a good day, evening or night. Bye-bye.